Hi, boys and girls. Welcome to the vodcast on the classification of life. But before we start talking about the classification of life, I just want to discuss what classification is. Classification is a way to organize certain things in a particular order, so this way you can find them or identify them easily. So if you think about your everyday lives, you probably classify things such as your songs on your iPod. Maybe you do them from favorite song to least favorite song, or maybe you do them simply alphabetically by song or by band name. Well, scientists are no different. When it comes to the organisms that live here on Earth, scientists classify them. By definition, classification is the arrangement of organisms into groups based on their similarities. The reason why scientists classify organisms on Earth is because this allows them to know what species are on Earth, see the relationships between the different types of species on Earth, and also to understand the characteristics of all the different species on Earth. But in order to classify them, scientists have to look at their history. So let's get into what we call phylogeny. Now the study of phylogeny is basically the study of the evolutionary history of organisms on Earth. So here we have a group of frogs. They're all different species of frogs, but based on certain similarities and characteristics that we see, we know them to be as frogs. So some of the hallmark characteristics that these frogs share, if you take a look at their eyes, usually their eyes are larger in proportion to the rest of their head, and they're usually found near the top or on the top of their head. Their mouths have a distinct shape to them. The actual body shape of frogs are very similar throughout. If you take a look at the pictures of these frogs, you'll notice that their body shapes are fairly similar, even though they're different kinds of frogs. So because these organisms on the screen here share these similarities, that's how we identify them to be frogs. The reason why these frogs look similar to one another is because they evolved from some common ancestor. And as we said, this is where phylogeny comes in, so let's take a closer look at it. Instead of frogs, we're taking a look at a picture of the phylogeny of whales. So this is the history of evolution, or how animals have changed over time, to turn into modern-day whales that we see in our books and on TV and even in the ocean if you go whale watching. Now scientists classify organisms throughout their phylogeny using four similarities. They look for similarities in fossils. They look for similarities in internal and external body features. They compare their DNA and see what similarities and what percentage of the DNA is similar to one another. And believe it or not, they also take a look at the early stages of development when these organisms are embryos. So based on these four items that scientists look at, they're able to piece together a timeline of change for these different creatures. And when we study the phylogeny, we can actually start to see the shared characteristics amongst different organisms over the span of many, many years. Whales originally started out as some land creature, and as that creature found it more difficult to find food, they started to go towards the water and then found food there. Indohyus, all the way down to modern-day odontocetes, tooth whales, and mysticetes, which are the baleen whales, you can see a series of changes in their DNA which caused them to be better suited for the water environment to make them more effective hunters. And when we start to put those characteristics and similarities together and group them together, we start to form what are called the six kingdoms of life. Now, as you can see, we only have five pictures, but one of these kingdoms is actually broken up into two separate kingdoms, so we'll get to that in a second. But let me introduce you to the kingdoms of life that we have here on Earth. First of all, this picture of the tiger, we all know as an animal, so he belongs, or she belongs, to the kingdom of Animalia, which includes all the animals on Earth. This organism belongs to the kingdom Plantae, which, if you take a look at the first five letters, spells out the word plant, so that has all the plants in the kingdom. Our next kingdom, represented by all these mushrooms, is the fungi kingdom. And then, if we take a look below, we have a kingdom called Protista. And then last, but not least, we have these single-celled organisms called bacteria, and there are two kingdoms for bacteria. You have eubacteria, and you have archaebacteria. So let's take a look at the characteristics that organisms must have to be placed into one of these kingdoms. Okay, to get into the kingdom of Animalia, the organism has to be multicellular, and each cell must have a nucleus. It also must have to move from place to place, so that means not just move in one spot, they have to move from one place and go to another, and then respond to the environment. So I'm sure you can imagine what organisms are in the animal kingdom, but here are some examples. Now, we have a manta ray at the top. We have a tarantula in the bottom left-hand corner, which creeps some of you guys out. And then we have this adorable koala bear, which hopefully offsets the tarantula that might be freaking you out right now. So that's the kingdom Animalia. To be a member of the kingdom Plantae, there are single-celled organisms and there are multicellular organisms, and they all have a nucleus. 
However, the one thing that plants do that most other organisms don't really do is make their own food. So they absorb sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, and they use the process of photosynthesis to produce their own food. And that's one of the hallmark characteristics as to why an organism is in the kingdom plantae. So here's some examples of members of the kingdom plantae. You have the Venus flytrap. You have some moss in the top right. Then you have these cool looking plants called monkey faced orchids. Because if you look at them, they kind of look like monkey faces. So these are examples of plants. Now fungi, that's a tricky kingdom because way back when they first started classification, fungi used to be considered a plant. However, when you take a look at the cell structure and what they do and how they do things, they're actually quite different from plants. So they are single-celled, mostly multi-celled organisms, but unlike plants, where plants make their own food, fungi do not. They absorb nutrients from decomposing organisms, so they have to get their food from someplace else, kind of like animals do. And some examples of fungi include mushrooms, as you can see in the top two, and then you can also have your mold, which grows on food that you've probably seen in bread and, and food that's been left out over a long period of time. That's the kingdom fungus. Now, the kingdom protista mostly has single-celled organisms, but there are some simple multi-celled organisms in that kingdom as well. Basically, any organism that has a nucleus in the cell, but does not belong in the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, or the fungi kingdom, all get thrown into the protista kingdom. So as you can see, the four kingdoms that we have listed right now all have cells with nuclei in them. However, not all living things have a nucleus. The last two kingdoms don't, and these are our bacterial kingdoms. So archaeobacteria are single-celled organisms that have no nucleus and live in environments where most organisms won't survive. Some of these environments are extremely salty. Other environments are extremely hot. We have a picture of a hot spring at Yellowstone National Park. And these are pools of water that get heated up by pockets of magma underground. Just to give you an idea of the size and scale of this thing, you'll notice that there's a walkway at the bottom of the picture. So this is a walkway with some people on it. Now, these hot springs can get very, very hot. They can get up to 194 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the archaeobacteria live on the outer edges of this hot spring. So where you see the yellow bands and the orange bands located here and here, that's where archaeobacteria colonies are formed. And then we have our last category of eubacteria. Eubacteria are single-celled organisms, just like the archaeobacteria, with no nucleus, just like the archaeobacteria. However, they don't live in extreme areas. They can live in milder areas, such as the soil that you walk on outside. They actually live inside of your body in your large intestines, and you're reminded of that every time you pass gas. And they also can live in the water. So these are the six kingdoms that we have. Now, when you take a look at the kingdoms, the kingdoms will get broken up into smaller groups. So let's take a look here. These are the different levels of organization within each kingdom. Now, I've used this upside-down triangle to give you an idea of the amount of species or organisms per group. So, as you can see, the kingdom is the widest part of the triangle, which means it holds the most organisms. And as we get down the triangle down to species at the end, the size of each level decreases because the number of each organisms decrease. So, kingdom is the first level and the biggest level, followed by phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. So it goes from the largest, from kingdom, down to the smallest, where species is found. Now you will have to remember the order of these levels of organization. I always remember that king, Philip, came over for grape soda. So that little mnemonic device allows me and helps me to remember the order from largest to smallest of each category so let's take a look and see how these organisms get sorted out as we go from the largest classification of kingdom down to the smallest classification of species. Now we're going to take a look at the kingdom of Animalia. And you can see all the different species that are found inside of this kingdom. And they're wide ranging. You have a beetle on the upper left. And you have this panda bear just lounging in some branches. With each level, there's always certain rules or characteristics that these organisms must have to get in. For example, we have the kingdom of Animalia, which includes all the organisms that can move and respond to the environment and have cells with a nucleus. If we want to go down to one of the phylum called Chordata, these organisms that get into the phylum of Chordata must have a spinal cord and a spine. So if you take a look at the organisms that we have on top, not all of them are going to make it. The beetle won't make it. The manta ray won't make it. The clam won't make it. Nor will the spider make it. However, all the other organisms will be in that group called Chordata. Now, after we leave Chordata, we go on to the next group of organization. 
Now that we've finished with the phylum of chordata, the next level of organization would be class. And the class that we're going to go to is called mammalia. Now mammalia is going to include all the mammals that are left over in our group of organisms at the top. So remember, mammals give birth to live young, they nurse their young, they're warm-blooded, and they have hair or fur. We have to take a look at which of these organisms do not meet those rules, and then they get booted out of the club. The only mammals that we have left are the three bears, the bat, and keyboard cat. So now that we're done with the class of mammalia, we have to now go down to the level of order. When we go down to the level of order, we're going to go into the order called carnivora. And carnivora means that these organisms have teeth that are designed for shredding food. With that being said, bats don't have teeth like that, so that's going to leave us with the three bears and keyboard cat. So after we leave order, we come to family, and then the family that we're going to go to is ursidae. And ursidae means bear. So basically, the only organisms that are going to make it into this group are the bears that we have left. So that would bring us the panda bear, the grizzly bear, and the polar bear. Now that we're done with family, we're going to go down to the next level of classification called genus. And the genus that we're going to file into is the genus called Ursus. And there's only two of these bears that make it in there. Those two bears are the grizzly bear and the polar bear. Now the panda bear doesn't make it in there because it's in a different genus called Aelorpoda. And if you take a look at the meaning of Aelorpoda, it really means cat foot. So there's a structure in their paws that makes them different from grizzly bears and polar bears. So even one little structural change like that can separate it out into its own group. So again, we're taking a look at the different relationships of the structures and physical characteristics of these creatures. And then lastly, we come down to our last and final group called species. So the species that we're going to go to is called maritimus, which means ocean. So which one of these bears do you find in the ocean? You find the polar bear. So the polar bear is also known as Ursus maritimus. And that's what's known as the scientific name for the bear. So after taking a look here, boys and girls, going through our levels of classification, Kingdom is going to have the most amount of creatures in it. However, as we continue to classify organisms based on their structures, we get down to one single individual in a species. Now, we briefly touched on scientific names with the polar bear, Ursus maritimus. And the reason why we give animals scientific names First and foremost, scientists use scientific names to reduce the amount of confusion amongst organisms and their identity. So, for example, you have scientists from all over the world. Americans may say cat. A scientist in Spain will call it gato. There's that language barrier there where you have two different words meaning the same thing, so there could be confusion there. However, if you use a scientific name for an organism, then everyone's going to know what that is. In addition, there's another problem with using common names, as we call them. So here we have a picture of one of the big cats that are resident here in America. And if you look at it, and you ask yourself, what type of cat is that? You might say mountain lion. You may say puma. You may say cougar. And if you said all three of those names, then you'd be right in all three of those names. However, this animal's got more than three common names. And that's what we call those names, common names, names that we just normally call them, that everyone kind of knows. So in addition to cougar, mountain lion, and puma, this cat's called a painter, this cat's called an American lion, this cat is called a catamount, and a panther. So if you've never heard of the words painter or American lion or catamount, you might not know what someone was talking about. But if they said it was a puma, you'd be like, oh yeah, I know that one. I've heard of that before. So common names can bring in some confusion. And that's why the scientists, again, use scientific names to reduce that confusion. And to come up with a scientific name, Scientists use a system called binomial nomenclature. And binomial nomenclature is a two-name naming system. So bi means two, nomial means name, and then nomenclature. And the two names that they use are the genus and the species. So as you can see, the mountain lion or painter or cougar, its scientific name is Felis concolor. So any scientist that you say that to that specializes in the study of this animal knows exactly who you're talking about. 
So when you take a look at the scientific name that was created through binomial nomenclature, the name Felis comes from the genus of the animal, and then Conchlor comes from the species of the animal. And that concludes tonight's vodcast on classification of living things. Thank you very much for your time, boys and girls. Seven.